Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. Welcome to show number 12. I just can't help counting down each and every show. I'll get over it sometime, but it's been such an amazing journey since this all started and watching it all grow. I guess I like to remind myself of it, and uh, we have a great show this week. Let me tell you the story of what happened. When I was introduced to uh, this week's guest, I've learned something that I, uh, I would not have thought of in a million years. The question came down to this. Name me um, a profession, highly in demand, ideally suited for people over 55 and older. It can be a side income or better, it can be uh, one of those jobs you never leave home for. So the answer emerges from this week's guest who runs a production company in New York where she witnesses the demand firsthand all the time. But over 55, what I love about it is that you have this world experience. Now, I don't want to stream you along, but I ju just bear with me here uh, for a moment anyway. You will meet our guest, Adriana Davis, who is about our age. She is busy as a coach. She is head of her own company who takes a view on her job that I really like. On the other hand, uh, as we know, I don't particularly love the term baby boomer, but uh, I think it's too encompassing. <laughs> right. I'm excited for you to, to hear my talk with Adriana on Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. That is coming right up. <laughs> Also, in this week's show, in Mimi's Kitchen, something luscious is taking place as we speak. Hello, hello. Look how beautiful the fish is. That looks beautiful, Mimi. continue our adventure tour of history tourism you will love learning how the gold rush changed california uh, forever and it was 1848 when gold was discovered in california the that is coming right up like i said earlier this is our 12th show it has been several months in the planning we wanted to do a show that is about about positivity, about productivity and happiness for people over 55. So we developed Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. You know, it's about our love for food. And Mimi cooks up such amazingly healthy, tasty recipes. Now in her travel section, it's kind of a, a counterintuitive idea because I am not a world traveler, but I love venturing into parts unknown. And Live Squared. It's about our weekly live stream on lots of platforms and social media channels with amazing guests. And it's about our core value to live life authentically for positivity, productivity, and happiness. So maybe it's about time to jump back into Mimi's kitchen where she is already preparing today's luscious recipe. Well, hello, hello. Today we're going to have a uh, cod, beautiful filet of cod in the fryer. I'm going to spice it up with all the uh, spices I prepared earlier. Cumin, paprika, uh, garlic, oregano, parsley, and all dry um, dry no, no no fresh in here in this uh, marinade so i'm gonna start with uh, some kosher salt i'm just gonna go like that i should have brushed it with olive oil first but i it's okay i can do it on top so brush with like a a table a tablespoon of olive oil extra virgin olive oil the two sides just go like that all right, you don't have to put a lot of oil because it's going to go in the air fryer, which is wonderful way of cooking fish. So let's do this. 
So I'm gonna just put the spices generously. You go for it because it's good and it's spicy because we're gonna make some tacos. Fish taco. Yes, there you go. You put two sides also, like that. So, there you go. Oh my God, it smells so good. The cumin and the chili lime and mm mm mm. So I'm gonna tell you all the spices I put in there so you can uh, replicate that. Voila. See the fish, how it's uh, nice and coated from both sides. And it's going to be so delicious and spicy in this whole wheat, uh, organic whole wheat tortillas. It's going to be very nice. So let's do it. I'm going to put them in the air fryer that is already warm. Okay. And come back to make some avocado crema. Okay, Mimi, we will check right back with you. For the past several weeks, I have been touring the California gold country. It's where almost overnight, the discovery of gold changed California forever. Today, we take a detour into the valley from the gold mines in the foothills to the community in the valley that sustained thousands and thousands of miners from around the world who migrated in, in search of gold at Sutter's Fort. Sutter's Fort was a 19th century agricultural and trade colony in California established by Swiss pioneer John Sutter that was back in 1839. The fort served as a center of trade and agriculture and settlement that was in the Sacramento Valley and provided a cultural and social focus for settlers in the region as thousands of aspiring miners they arrived in California in search of gold. Now the fort quickly became a major hub for supplies and services for miners as well as a Center for Trade and Commerce. And it was 1848 when gold was discovered in California that led to the California Gold Rush. And this became one of the epicenters of the gold rush as thousands of aspiring miners arrived in California in search of gold. The fort quickly became a major hub for supplies and services for miners as well as a center for trade and commerce. However, the influx of people and the subsequent commercialization of the region, that eventually led to the decline of the fort's importance. And despite its eventual decline, Line, Sutter's Fort remains an important part of California's history. Today, visitors can visit the restored fort and explore the historic buildings and the exhibits, learning about the lives and the experiences of people. This week's show, we travel to the largest and the wealthiest mining town in California. Now, when we left Mimi's kitchen, that was just a short time ago, she was in the midst of preparing a, a luscious recipe with avocado. Hello, hello. As I said earlier, now I'm gonna make the avocado crema. This is so exciting for me because I love it. So we take the bullet, we bring it here. It does a very good job. Uh, it depends how much you want to make. You can, you can use one avocado or two. I'm going to use two avocados. Look how beautiful they are. Beautiful avocados. So for the avocado crema, you need avocado, of course. Cloves of garlic. If you like garlic, put two. If you don't, you put just one clove of garlic. Let's not do this one. I'm just going to go for one or let me come back i'm gonna get another one there you go got another avocado i did not like the the color that the other one i don't like them when they are brown beautiful see this is what i want so you go like that you check your bullet and just scoop it in there like this all right whoa this is creamy it's very nice already so you take your avocados and i always smash my uh, my garlic so it goes faster so for me i'm gonna put two cloves of garlic voila Okay, cilantro, 
my cilantro, fresh cilantro. Cut it a little bit so to help the machine do the job. There you go. So you can use sour cream or Greek yogurt. Either way will work. And you don't have to put a lot. Just to make it a little creamy like that. Now we get some lime juice. We'll go in there like that. A little pepper. And that makes a lot of noise, but it's good. <laughs> mm, all right. Let me see. Oh, nice. So I'm going to taste it. Let me get that little spoon here. Mm, very good. Very delicious. So my crema is ready. Now I, I cut some, um, I pickled some red onions and chopped some cabbage, red and green cabbage. So the fish is cooking, it's gonna be ready in like five minutes. We're gonna put the, to the tortillas together. I mean the tacos. All right, so see you later. Okay, Mimi, we will check back very, very soon. Okay, so earlier I introduced you to Adriana Davis. I was really surprised with uh, what I found out. I, I found out about a job, a profession, what some might call a gig, that most people don't even know about, which is in high demand, and especially well-suited older people, like those of us in our 50s and 60s and 70s on up. And I hope you don't mind how I um, have keeping you in suspense, but because of the novelty, I really felt that uh, I could have a little fun with it. So here is Adriana Davis, who is about our age and has lived a productive life with uh, something to offer us. And it's where we started out. But at first, let me just tell you this. We talked for it over an hour. It was too long for the streaming service that uh, distributes our shows everywhere. Uh, so you can watch the entire show. You just navigate over to bloomerboomer.com and in the searching field, you just type in her name, Adriana Davis. Meantime, back to the show. And I am excited that I have here today, Adriana Davis. Th thank you, Andy, and thank you for having me here today. I'm, I'm so looking forward to reaching out um, to you and your audience. Um, basically, my origin story, I, I was thinking about that, and I, I'm going to relate it to an old John Denver song, <laughs> Rocky Mountain High, in which he says, I was born in the summer of my 27th year. In other words, he hadn't fully gotten to where he wanted to be until he was 27 and discovered the mountains, and that, of course, led his whole career. Um, I got into um, the production business uh, and film and television, radio actually to begin with, um, a little later on than most people. Um, I didn't study it particularly in school. It was always my minors. I have degrees in politics <laughs> um, uh, from uh, in Washington. I went to school in Washington, DC. And I um, made sure all my minors were piano and uh, singing in the choir and uh, anything else I could think of to keep myself involved in production. I just didn't know that's what it was called. Um, so I wasn't lucky enough to have been born early enough where schools had TV studios. Um, now my school has all kinds of things, but uh, it didn't back then. So I did some theater there in school and I been studying piano from when I was um, eight years old. I also played violin and guitar. So the arts were for me. Um, my father always hoped I'd, you know, fall back on a legal career. <laughs> that most politics students follow, uh, but that didn't quite happen for me. So what I ended up was uh, my origin really began in my almost, just like John Denver, 28th, 29th year uh, in uh, Great Neck Public Access Television in Great Neck, Long Island. And I was living there at the time and I volunteered as a producer and then they ended up bringing me on. And I had my own community affairs show. I started doing um, 
production as well as learned editing because just like my name i'm a bit type a <laughs> i wanted my hands and everything normally a producer sits in the back and the editor you know kind of does things but i wanted to get my hands in there and lucky i did because today that's the way it's done you have to be a producer and an editor um, i also started my voiceover career um, at that public access channel um, because somebody didn't show up one day to do a local theater group's little commercial on public access. And so they said, hey, you've got a great, you should do it. You know, and I said, great. I didn't even sure what a voiceover was. So I really began, prior to that, um, I had started in public relations and trying to use my political degrees. I worked on the Statue of Liberty restoration in the 80s, um, 1986, which was a lot of parties. <laughs> but I also worked as a public information coordinator, dealt with the public, dealt with the press, took press tours. So I was always having my hand in it. And somehow when I went to Public Access Channel, it brought together the writing I'd always done, the what I thought would be on camera, but I found out I liked being behind the camera better, and the technology that I really enjoy. Um, I always have cameras and computers and all of it. Um, so it really brought everything together for me. Um, and also I was the kid who in the neighborhood put on all those plays that the parents had to sit through, you know, and I'd get all the kids to, I didn't know that was being a producer. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. So that kind of led me to, um, once I kind of graduated from public access, I ended up uh, working in news, uh, what we call electronic news gathering in uh, New York City, and I worked for, like I like to say, Alphabet, up and down the dial, A&E, History Channel, BET, ESPN, and a lot of court TV, because this was around the OJ time. So we were busy, busy with all those kinds of what we call run and gun, um, getting all the stories for those um, those outlets, and then they would edit them together, and, um, and they would make it to their nightly reports or whenever they were using it for. And from there, I ended up working more directly with A&E and History Channel and a few others for another production company where I was the production manager. And so I handled every production that came through. Um, we did all those investigative reports with Bill Curtis. Uh, you might remember those. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one hour kind of dramas, uh, you know, yeah. kind of investigative. And uh, from there, I and, and then on a couple of films that came through that production company, but my Former partner and I, the other D, D squared, um, uh -huh. got the itch to make sure that we would start our own. We got offered, of all things, um, a wastewater treatment plant video for an engineering company. <laughs> and, wow. yeah. yeah. And a film at the same time. And it's a series of films that I've worked on now for 25 years, more like 28 years, um, about the Iraqi Jewish culture and history. And that was our first. So we were offered both those things at the same time. And that was, we made the decision to leave our day jobs, as they say, and start D Squared Media. And that was, as I say, 28 years ago. Since then, we've produced, um, I have eight films about the Iraqi Jewish community of varying lengths that have played all over the world. Most famous of them was called The Last Jews of Baghdad. Um, which played on PBS and a number of and festivals everywhere. And it was a community that did not want to tell its story. So it took a long time to kind of get them to trust us and, and, and work with us on it. Um, we just completed our last one. It's called Searching, um, sorry, Saving the Iraqi Jewish Archives, uh, which is a story in itself. I've already gone too long, but I, I could tell you about that later. Is there a particular vision that you have uh, in what you're doing? Yeah, B Squared Media is my, you know, my company, as I say, for 28 years. That's a catch all. Um, we wanted to be a kind of almost laboratory to bring other artists together. And so we didn't, we weren't just going to be, what do they call us now? Multi hyphenates? Uh, you know, sounds other, good to me. <laughs> producer, writer, editor, uh -huh. you know, chief cook and bottle washer, um, you know, and voiceover. Voiceover was something that, like I say, I sort of stumbled into. Um, but since then, I've, Myself as a voice artist is one thing, but what I've really enjoyed doing is coaching others. And I've coached hundreds of students um, over the years, over the same 20 odd years, um, in workshops, in one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, used to be in person, now they're a little bit more over Zoom and, and Skype. Um, and they've all been of varying um, degrees of, of 
proficiency, but also some that just had a love of maybe performing, but, you know, they were in radio in college, but then real life hit and they had to go, you know, do something else. And now we're kind of coming back around to it. So I've almost exclusively worked with um, people in either pre-retirement or those who were about to or have already retired and now have the time and uh, the resources, frankly, to be able to concentrate on voice acting. You've done so many things. It strikes me that perhaps uh, the word survivor uh, is, could be uh, ascribed to you. Do you feel that way or is that out of choice or necessity? You know, I've, I've often spoken at um, um, alumni groups and other types of groups that have asked me to come in and speak about independent filmmaking, sometimes also voice acting. And I always start off with, hi, I'm Adriana, I'm addicted to making films, you know, and to telling stories. And that's where, uh, you know, as I said, I, and I always say then too, if your parents don't, when I was younger, if your parents don't understand what you're doing, you're doing it right. Um, <laughs> because because my, my mom and dad never really did kind of get a, you know, a teacher and my dad was in finance. Um, you know, it, that just didn't ring. They love the arts, but they didn't see it as a way. Dad said, uh, I'm going to be out there with a tin cup, you know, asking for money, you know. But I, what I realized was that as a survivor of sticking to what I wanted to do. And really, I, I went really far into the LSAT process and applying to law schools, got into a couple, um, but just didn't go. And it, in a way, I'm sorry, it would help me in the entertainment business, actually, uh, to have a law degree. But it, it, you're, I think you're right. It is a bit of surviving um, to stick to what and I'm lucky enough to have been able to have done what I wanted to do. But I think anybody can if you take, do it in your degree. Do what you follow those dreams. Follow, I mean, everybody says that, but make them real. And, and that means maybe adjusting your dream a little bit. You know, I mean, I thought I'd be the next you know, Pat Benatar or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or Carol yeah. King. That's who I really wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> sure. but, but I realized that on camera and in the front of the audience isn't where I really shine. It's, it's behind the camera and in the edit room. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is uh, New York City a better place maybe to have all these varied uh, talents or do you think that could be picked up anywhere? Well, it helps, um, you know, being on the either coast, you know, and Florida too is quite a big production state, uh, Chicago, uh, Boston even. Um, but to be honest, the way everything has changed in not just the last few years because of the pandemic, but even before then, um, I have been in recording sessions for voice where the talent was in, you know, the West Coast, uh, the director was in Texas, the client was in Minnesota, and the engineer was in New York. You know, I mean, you know, it, you can't, and the other part, um, which I, I don't know if you want, how specific you want me to get about voice acting, but it is becoming a business where you will work it out of your home. It is no, studios are closing left and right. Not so much in those big centers I just mentioned, but um, the home studio has taken over. And that's why that could be a little bit of a trepidation for somebody new to this if they're not into the tech, you know, kind of thing. It's not that complicated. There's, you know, it's much easier than when you're creating visual and audio, <laughs> like a film <laughs> or a video. <laughs> but it's, um, there's still a little bit of tech to it as well. You have to kind of want that side of it too. And you can get quite successful at it um, in what I like to call the hidden areas in voice acting, which I didn't talk about the other side of D squared media. And that's the corporate side. I, I mentioned we did a sewer video, <laughs> but um, you know, that has been our bread and butter too. I do a lot of medical, a lot of legal, um, and in fact, um, and then advertising as well. So there's a lot of applications for voice, or in my case, video too, in, in the corporate world. Uh, some may be aware of that in their, you know, if we're talking about retirees or those in the working world, they, they may experience these videos like in human resource offices <laughs> when you have yeah. to watch one of those videos. Yeah, <laughs> well, guess what? They pay. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh -huh. And there's always a voiceover. And in medical, huge. I always like to say they can't, if a 
And it's not just to the patients, it's also within the medical community to educate about new products, new techniques, um, even to do a, a kind of curriculum vitae of, of doctors and, and mm -hmm. so they can advertise themselves for other um, hospitals or other communities. I always like to say you can't just put up, if we're doing something about getting screened for, you know, I don't know, colon cancer, you can't just put up a picture, you know, you've got mm -hmm. to have a voiceover to it. It's got to have that component uh, to reach the audience well. So mm -hmm. it's almost like a guaranteed if you're going to do a medical video, there, yeah. there will be a voice component. So just uh, to get a little bit into the nuts and bolts uh, sort of thing, uh, so someone would have to invest in the uh, equipment. Uh, talk a little bit about that. You probably already have it right there. Um, it's a um, any kind of computer, laptop even, that you might have. I tend to do my, my creative work on a Mac and then tend to do my nuts and bolts stuff and business stuff on a PC, but it could be either. You then need a voice capturing program um, and it would be, uh, you know, there are lots of varied kinds. I like Twisted Wave. I mean, there's a there's a ton of them. Everything from something free to something very expensive that um, engineers, professional engineers use, which is something called Pro Tools. You don't need something that fancy. Um, you need something in the middle between that. Then you need a darn good microphone. Um, and it can be even just a USB plug and play. It doesn't have to be a super fancy, you know, microphone hanging in front of you as you would see in a studio. And the biggest thing you need is a space to be able to dampen and quiet where you're going to um, record. Many times what you're recording is auditions, of course, for um, various projects. And sometimes the final product um, and if so, you're, you're not going to be required to actually edit that to the video. You're going to send them all the tracks that you recorded or all the files, if you want to think of it that way. And so you only have to know basic editing. I am not an audio engineer. I never claim to be. My films and everything, all my videos, all I hire outside um, uh, audio people that sweet, they do what they call audio sweetening and clean everything up way beyond my ability. Um, and, but so you don't have to be that, but you do have to get a basic idea of how to send these files to your clients that you're recording for. And other than that, so sound deadening, a good space to work in, and sometimes a walk-in closet is your best friend, believe it or not. Um, bathroom is the worst because that's, that's, that's going to echo all over the place. So you need good sound uh, deadening. You need a good microphone. You need a, a one audio capture program that is also your editing program, and then a Mac or a PC, whatever you're going to run it off of. And uh, certainly, and then a lot, this, you know, you're going to not think this was one of the requirements, but you're going to need to learn to market. If you're not already into marketing, that's what you need to do. Well, I can go deeper into that, but that's a really long discussion. <laughs> yeah. A sound deadening room would be uh, if they're in their in their den, let's say, or how would they deaden the sound? You could here? be you're going to buy a product. Um, you're going to depending on how much you can invest everything from something that sits on a desktop that looks like a V and your voice goes in the microphone goes in it and you're dead in this way okay. to an actual sound uh, proof booth. <laughs> so we have a lot of basement um, voiceover <laughs> companies <laughs> because everybody you know picks a little corner of their basement carpet deadens the sound gets you know foam and you know, I mean, there's there's you my advice would be to um consult with some like an audio engineer that can help you create that studio you know some of the basics of it but why i mean it, it, there's not a huge overhead investment in this business is you don't need a factory you don't need employees you don't need anything else. These are the basic tools and they will work for you for a very long time. It's not like you have to keep replacing them all the time either. Um, so it's, it's, and then the other thing is to um, keep, keep, understand the basics of, of what the market is looking for in terms of voice. If I can jump into that, I don't know if I'm- Sure, jumping. that's fine. <laughs> Um, that is probably, um, Andy, more important or equally as important as the microphone you buy is to understand that there is no such thing. I'm going to use advertising or the what we call the commercial side of voice acting as an example, but this also applies to corporate work. 
And I'm fond of saying that 99% of your work is going to come from corporate. Many people out there think they're going to be the next voice of McDonald's. Yeah. I hope they all are. Yeah. But that's tough. It's right. hard. And you're competing with celebrities and professional actors. But the main thing is that in, in advertising and corporate wants to be like advertising, right? you know, like commercial, mm -hmm. uh, it is no longer the deep throated, uh, uh, I'm going to say, you know, a uh, man that is telling you what to buy. Uh, Madison Avenue has finally realized that everybody buys things mm -hmm. <laughs> and people want to be sold to, uh, they don't want to be sold to, but they want to be met at their level. And so all voices book, all voices book. There's no such thing anymore because it has nothing really to do with your voice. It has to do with creating an emotion in the listener. And that's why I never use the term voiceover anymore. I call it voice acting, oh, as okay. many people do. Many people do. I'm not the only one. I didn't invent that. But you are a voice actor. You are transferring emotion from a bunch of words on a page into the mind and the heart of the listener to inspire them to do something, buy something, try something, ask their friend about something. You want to motivate them into action. That's really what voice acting is. Fantastic description. And as far as, uh, I know you said it's a long de uh, description, but if you could just briefly talk about marketing. Are we talking about a website or what are we talking about? Tons of them. There's what they have out there now. Um, are we like to call the supermarket of voices. Um, there are there's something called Voice One Two Three. There's a, a whole bunch of different places out there. I even belong to something called Mandy.com, which is a production site, and Mandy has a whole voice section where people post jobs. But if you keep waiting and only applying to what they're posting it's you're not going to be busy enough not to call it a true business it, and again it's all how much time you can put into it uh, but if you actively start to market your talents and try to find producers like me who hire voice talent uh, and do all the work that you need to do ahead of time beyond setting up your physical studio working with a professional coach to create a professional demo reel I can't tell you, Andy, how many times I've been in this business a long time. In the old days, I used to get voice actors that would say to me, well, can I just sit it with my tape recorder <laughs> and just read a couple of things? Yeah. So many things wrong with that statement. First one is it is not reading. It is acting. And a lot of people, one of the things I thought we might talk about was you said, what are some of the pitfalls or something? And that is the number one thing. People think, oh, it's reading. Well, I'm retired now. I can set up all the tech stuff. I like all that. I'm mm -hmm. going to do audio books. When you do an audio book, you're doing 200 voices possibly with all the backstories that go with each one of them. They're very complicated to do. None of this is reading. So in marketing yourself, you've got to find those who hire voice talent on a regular basis. It could be audio studios themselves with casting agents. It could be finding an agent for yourself, which is very difficult when you're starting out. But better is to find small production companies like mine, or maybe even slightly bigger, and try to uh, and get them your demo reel. You don't, by the way, you don't go anywhere in this business without a demo reel. You must have a demo reel. And there are very, very kinds of demo reels. So I'm kind of coming back around to what I'm saying is, if you're new to this world, but you're still intrigued by it and you want to learn about uh, voice acting or even production in general, you've got to work with somebody, a coach or somebody who can teach you this world and open it up to you. Because when that happens, you're not only going to, you know, what do they say? Walk it like a duck, talk like a duck. You know, you're not only going to do all the things and have, you're going to have that foundation that you're laying for your business. You don't have to build a building. You just have to lay a good foundation. And it's not so much a coach like me teaching you technique as it is getting you to open up, particularly with those of us over 55 who are great for this business. They want voices uh, of that age, but you've got to find. And then the other people you want to find 
are people like, not just me, but if you, you may in your career know a marketing director in a, in a company or the PR department um, or something. And those folks are also hiring for, uh, they might work with a production company like me to create an internal communication video of, of some kind, but they may also be able to hire you directly depending on what they're doing. For instance, I used to do voiceovers. I'd get hired. One of our clients was um, Smith Barney. And we used to do a weekly, they had a whole TV studio. I mean, all these companies do. And I don't know if that's shocking or news to people now, but it always was back then. Morgan Stanley has them. American Express has it. Whole studios that rival anything in, a television, in the television world. And they um, would hire us to do a weekly rap show that we, we did the videotaping for it. But one day they were running, they needed a special emergency communication from the president and they needed a voiceover introduction. And I, they knew I did voiceovers. I was there. I did the voiceover for yeah. it. You know, so there are all these little hidden places that hire talent um, or at least will a, be a conduit for you to find someone like me who hires that 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 talent. I hope that makes sense. So your message is to reach out to these organizations or companies with the prospect that maybe uh, you'll find an opportunity. You need a marketing plan, just like uh -huh. any business has a marketing plan or should have a marketing plan. You need a plan of attack. You need to know what, you know, once you've got all your um, infrastructure put together and you've done some training, uh, and I don't care what level you're at, you, you always could use, well, I always need more training. You, you need, you, once you have that and you've got your good demo reel that you like, um, be it a commercial reel or a corporate reel, I'm getting very specific now, but there are different reels for different ways of marketing. Um, once you have all that in hand, you then have to present yourself out there and that's when you would start to approach. And you have to decide, is this an A prospect, a D prospect? You know, what, what level is this? I Something that opened up for me, um, my mother was trying to sell her home in Florida and the real estate agent used one of these mechanical voices, which are even more now, this is a number of years ago, but AI is taking over, you know? So uh, there, and it was just horrible sounding. And so just of my own volition, I went ahead and re-recorded it and sent it to them. Well, once that real estate agent heard it, the other real estate agent wanted wanted one for their client and this one wanted it. And it wasn't a huge paying business, but it was a little, little bits here and there. And it got my voice out there. And that's the important thing. That's another way of the marketing, getting your voice heard. So you, so you mentioned, mm -hmm. yeah. So I do phone systems for people. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. What did you I, say? I do, phone, I do phone systems for people, you know, press one for da da da, uh -huh. press two, uh -huh. you know. And luckily I had this, uh, happened to be real estate again, real estate business where they went through a lot of turnover. And so I got to come in a lot and redo their voices sure, sure. <laughs> for their system. So, but all of that gets you noticed. And that's what you want, you know, that's what, that's part of the marketing plan as well. Yeah. And you did mention pay. Um, can mm -hmm. you talk about that a little bit? Well, there is there are rate cards out there, but that tends to fall in the union side of things. Um, I'm talking mostly non-union. I'm not in a in a union uh, for uh, voice acting, uh, but the it's, it's more a negotiation process between you and the producer. And what I've always, I used to do in some of the workshops I used to work at, um, I would do a little role play with our, our class, you know, with the class and be able to show them how it works when a producer calls. The, it's the game is whoever names a price first loses, you know? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> but each project in, in my, look, there's the producers get a bad rap, but in my world, it's always a question of, this is what I have to pay on this particular one can you do it for that? I know that's not your usual rate. Would you be willing? I think you'd be good for the client, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to tell, you tell me no too many times, then we're playing in different ballparks, right? right? If I'm not offering you what, what is right, what I have, and you have to go find others that will. Um, but it, it, it really does vary by, in the, in the corporate world, especially it varies by project. Yeah. And the commercial world, it's a little more unionized, but and there's a little more of a rate card, but there are plenty of commercials out there, local commercials and things like that that don't require, that aren't union-based. Well, everything you've said is just brilliant, and, I, uh, and it's great information, and uh, I really appreciate your time. 
I thank you so much for having me and I wish all those future voice actors out there or anyone who wants to even make a movie, <laughs> um, you know, I hope you do, do take a little few steps down that road. Again, so that was only half of it. To see it all, just go to BlueBirdRumor.com and in the search bar you can put in her name, Adriana Davis. So uh, now you know why I have been keeping this such a secret, you might say. Y you know now. If you want to make some extra money or you want to go all the way and becoming a full-fledged voice actor, what she calls a voice actor, if you want to contact Adriana or learn more, here is the contact information for that. And you can also find it in the uh, show notes on our website, bloomerboomer.com. And in the search box, all you have to do is type in her name, uh, voice acting, or uh, if you have questions, you can also reach me at bloomerboomer.com. Well, let's just take a, a final look into Mimi's kitchen before we go. Hello, hello. Look how beautiful the fish is. It's cooked, it's flaky, it's nice, it's spicy. So now I'm just gonna put it together. So the way I do it for the, the tortilla, I, so I put some of that avocado uh, crema that I made. I spread it right here. I toasted the tortilla, which is nice and crunchy. If you don't like, like it too toasty, so don't. So this is how I, do. and I just put the fish either like this you can put it this way or you can also just cut it in little pieces and you know and all around so the fish and I got some nice organic uh, uh, red cabbage and white cabbage green cabbage sorry I shredded all that all right I am going to put a little bit more avocado on top because who doesn't like avocado all right so this is roasted uh, in a ham peppers they are a little bit spicy if you don't like spicy don't add them but I do like them so you put a little bit here a little bit there and you add your nice uh, pickled red onions. Oh my gosh, those are delicious and it gives you the crunch you need and, and the spiciness and the, oh, so delicious. And some cilantro. All right. Et voila. So some people like salsa on top like tomato uh, i think this is uh, just the fish the taste of the fish is right there uh, nothing is competing with the fish so all those um, elements they work together in harmony and i love it and it smells delicious now we just have to eat it i'll see you next time for another recipe so long thank you so much mimi as always and thank you so much for for tuning in to let's talk food travel live squared if you enjoyed the, this episode or you learned something new i want to tell you three ways that you can support the show and keep let's talk food travel live squared going number one get yourself subscribed every week I am bringing on the, uh, the influencers and the people who can teach you something or have something interesting to share. So just uh, take a moment and hit that subscribe button. And then number two, this is really the ultimate way uh, to support Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. And it really just takes less than a minute. Yeah, you can write something short and sweet like, you know, like I love this show or it has changed uh, my life, or something you learned from it. I'm not exaggerating that I read reviews every day, and every single one, whether short or long, it means everything to me. The more reviews means the higher we rank on all those algorithms, which means bigger guests. So take a minute, leave a review. 
And three, just share the show with your friends. Just hit that share button. I'm eternally grateful. And thank you so much for supporting this show. I will see you again next Tuesday for another episode of Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared.